Thank you so much. Let me start by expressing how thankful I am to be able to give a lecture to you today on the impact of urban and regional leadership when addressing global challenges. Being an artist myself, I, I like to think in metaphors and I kept on thinking if research and innovation strategies for smart specialization would be a type of sport, what type it would be. Since I play tennis, I started thinking about tennis, but it's absolutely not because tennis is a solo or duo sport where with every move of your body, you're preparing for the successful service of the ball. Smart specialization is more like a basketball where there's a strong team element of the sport, where collaboration leads to success, where there's an energizing effect of collaboration and where there's a strong impact of leadership up to a point that it makes a game winning or losing. Luckily in smart specialization, there are no winners or losers. So building on the idea of Simon Sinek of the infinite game, smart specialization is more like an infinite game where the objective is to keep playing and to keep the players in the game. And throughout this game, the institutions evolve, capabilities evolve, and there is such a value in the network built up that it is just, it can be seen as an upgrade or an add on to the system through which the system evolves. And again, here, leadership is key. The leadership research is not my main line of research. I would like to first give you an idea what has inspired me to research on the impact of urban and regional leadership in public policy setting. So in the past years with my team, with my colleagues at the Joint Research Center, we have been focusing on the international, on the cross-border dimension of smart specialization that is connecting regional and national innovation ecosystems along similar or shared smart specialization priority areas. We have developed a methodological framework through which we have facilitated cross-border synergies across investments with the idea to make innovation policy more efficient and to reshape European value chains along strategic areas of growth. And I myself, I kept on observing these collaborative efforts, their so-called partnerships. And I noted that the ones with a visible and clear leadership and with a well-defined governance structure, they advance more and they're more likely to obtain their objectives. So this is what has inspired me to look at the conceptual framework and also at the, the leadership impact assessments existing mostly in the business sphere and develop something for, the, for collaborative public actions that help leaders and, and team members to enable their collaborations to become more efficient and successful. Before we jump into the content, I would like to invite you for a dinner game. So this is a lecture where it's not that you are allowed to use your phone, but you are encouraged. So please scan the QR code that you see on the slide or enter in the slido.com, the number C489. And uh, please share the first words that come to your mind when we are talking about leadership. And please do participate because this is an important feedback for me that you are with me. Yes, okay, I have some people who are with me and that you are not in your after lunch siesta. Okay, so the first words that come to your mind when we are talking about leadership. This little game is going to result in a word cloud, meaning that the words that are inserted more frequently are going to be shown in bigger size. You can insert as many words as you wish one by one. Empathy, strong human agency, decision, guidance. Very nice. Thank you for participating. So my idea was with this little game is just to show that when <laughs> When um, we are, when we are, when we try to measure the impact of leadership, leadership is such a complex area that there are just like so many 
dimensions we have to take into consideration to be able to really measure the, the impact. Okay, how I started preparing for my lecture. I have done a quick search among my most recent Kindle notes for the word leadership, because there's just an abundance of books that deal with leadership, including um, scientific fields that focus on leadership from network analysis through team science, urban planning to behavior economics, besides the obvious business books. Why? Because leadership is just such a game changer. And also I'm sure that your inboxes and your social media walls are full of quotes from people whose ambitions are aligned with your values or whose ambitions are less aligned with your values. But this is because leadership is present not just in professional settings, but in every social setting of ours. As they say, we don't quit workplaces, but we quit our bosses, or mainly the main difference between feeling miserable at a workplace or feeling fulfilled and happy is mostly connected to your boss. Okay, let's jump into it. Why do we have to talk about leadership when we are addressing grand challenges? Because the scale of response when addressing grand challenges require the reinvention of political, economic, and social conventions from travel to social interactions, from investment to decision-making. And leadership has been identified as an important factor contributing to growth and development, mostly in the business sphere, and effective leadership contributing to the success of places, of cities, regions, and countries. Given the urgency and the nature of the problem when addressing global challenges, in case of urban strategies and related actions or regional strategies and related actions also relate to the challenges of leadership in terms of capabilities, legitimacy, credibility. Therefore, it is very important to analyze the context and the impact of leadership. Why? Because Cities are often the first responders of climate emergencies or decisions taken in cities have tremendous impact on our climate, but also clear leadership can be identified in case of cities who are in the front line of sustainable development efforts. And these efforts, sustainable development efforts, require collaboration, require crossing borders and organizations, require the involvement of a great variety of communities and stakeholders. And in such cases, the impact of leadership on the motivation and commitment of stakeholders provides an insight into how leadership can contribute to the transformation of places, of cities and regions, because these transformations are necessary to enable places to adapt to social, economic, or environmental changes. Thus, leadership has to, it has to be able to manage change efficiently. This is something that has been recognized long ago in the business sphere. Throughout the whole policy cycle, from, from design through implementation to evaluation, the alignment of stakeholders towards a specific policy objective requires a new understanding of, of leadership. And in multi-actor and transformative strategies, such as any kind of innovation strategies, but here we're talking about smart specialization strategies, these new forms of leadership needs to be together analyzed with the impact of leadership. Why? Because the lack of legitimate and collective leadership fails, fails or limits a territory to identify its needs, which in turn limits the mobilization of stakeholders. Therefore, I just really believe that it is time to start measuring the impact of leadership when we are talking about urban and regional agendas, especially when addressing global challenges, to be able to make these collaborations more efficient, sustainable, and successful. I have some data for you 
unpublished yet, or better said, it is under approval. So in 2020, with my team at the Joint Research Center, we have run a bigger research project. And in the framework of this research project, we ran a survey and we have asked um, smart specialization implementing authorities about their experiences, observations, and plans regarding smart specialization, focusing especially on governance, entrepreneurial discovery process, monitoring and evaluation, and policy measures. So altogether, we have received 79 responses, meaning 79 regional and national governments, and 33% of them from EU 13 countries, 89% from regional administrations, 11% from national administrations, 48% from more developed regions, 32% from less developed regions. What you see on the map is the coverage of the survey. So for example, for Spain, we have five plus responses received, meaning that we have received a response from the national government and from several regional governments. And it's again, some slide also prepare your phones. Before I share the result of the surveys with you, I would like to ask your, to guess. So what do you think? What do you think a dedicated political or management leadership is contributing more to the smart specialization implementation process? So is it a dedicated political or management leadership that is contributing more to the implementation process? I'm gonna wait a little bit more. Okay. All right, and the next question is very similar, but the opposite. So what do you think a political or a management leadership is withholding, hindering more the smart specialization implementation process? So is it the political or the management leadership that is hindering more the smart specialization implementation process? And what our authorities have responded is that in 18% of the cases, a dedicated management leadership is strongly contributing to the smart specialization implementation process. And in 44% of the cases, a dedicated political leadership is strongly contributing to the implementation process. On the other hand, only in 1% of the cases, um, an unadequate political leadership can strongly withhold the implementation process, while in 8% of the cases, an adequate management leadership can strongly withhold the implementation process. Okay, so another quiz. So which of the following factors do you think that smart specialization leadership contributes the most to? Select two, please. So the smart specialization leadership contributes the most to the promotion of trust, effective implementation of smart specialization, enhancing commitment of stakeholders, smart specialization government becoming a learning organization, promoting new ideas regarding innovation strategies, I'm very happy to see that you are with me. <laughs> All right. And uh, so what the smart specialization implementing authorities have responded that in more than half of the cases, the smart specialization implementing authorities leadership is strongly contributing to the effective implementation of smart specialization and in promoting trust among stakeholders. And in over one third of the cases, leadership has a strong role in enhancing commitment towards commitment of stakeholders toward policy objectives, promoting new ideas and narratives on innovation strategies, 
and small specialization governments becoming a learning organization. Do you see intermediary organizations like clusters or technology platforms that are the ones that, that contribute the most with leadership to the whole smart specialization implementing process with 68%, while higher, ed higher educational institutions in 37% of the cases, big and transnational companies 35, research and technology organizations 28%, and civil society only 9% and vocational and training centers only 4%. Okay, so we let's jump into the leadership impact assessment framework. And how we started is that, so the stages of motivation or loss of motivation can be translated into stages of attitudes within organization. We have identified five attitudes idealism, realism, stagnation, frustration, and apathy. I think we can all relate to that in some past experiences of ours in a fortunate situation. And so all these attitude states are requiring diverse responses from the leadership. Why? Because your attitude or anyone's attitude determines how you relate to the team members, how you relate to the work community, to the leadership, to the team, to the organizational culture, how you meet deadlines, how up to affecting your, up to affecting the brand that is the external communication. So we have defined four big areas and under each of these four big areas, 40 dimensions that are being assessed. So if you remember that game Chris about the word cloud, like how many dimensions you have to take into consideration to be effectively able to measure the impact of leadership. So we came up with four areas and 40 dimensions along which attitudes of leading and participating individuals are compared. So these areas are the attitudes towards the team, towards the partnership, that is your project, your collaborative project, towards your leadership and towards your own responsibilities. And this is with the idea to be able to pinpoint and identify areas that needs to be strengthened or improved. Just to highlight a few dimensions that are, are being assessed when it comes to attitude towards the team, it's about acceptance, trust, shared values, cynicism, individual op opportunities or conflict management, attitude towards the partnership, vision, organizational culture, structure, ethical behavior, reliability, error management, change management. When measuring perceptions, attitudes towards the leadership, it's about planning, involvement, delegation, control, feedback, recognition, leadership communication or decision, and towards your own responsibilities, work intensity, overload, goal, value conflicts, flexibility, responsibility or the feeling of usefulness. So these attitude states, the ones before these five attitude states are placed on a forced ranking scale based on which each attitude receives a value Then it is being weighted. And then after each assessment, it results in 40 index values. So for each dimensions of the assessment, there's an index value. This is how a simple result, sample result looks. So as you see on the upper left um, part of the figure for the blue, those are the attitudes towards the team. The yellow one is the, towards the hierarchy. The pink red one is towards the project. And it is the same color code actually. And the gray is towards own responsibilities. So the red line is a sample result and there is a dashed red line at zero that shows critical level. So values that fall below, index values that fall below zero are critical and needs improvement. In this case, it is the team spirit. Then on the figure, you see a dashed blue line. That is the acceptable level. The values that fall below the acceptable level needs to be paid attention to. So, in this case, it is vision, commitment, or work usefulness. But in more specifically, so if an index value has 
a value of above two that shows an outstanding attitude with realistic and idealistic responses dominating. So rational work, team play, commitment to achievement is present in the project. If it's between one and two, the area works properly with idealistic and realistic attitude status. There is some individualism present, less team play. If the values are between 0 0.5 and 1, that shows stagnation. There's problems of motivation. Between 0 and 0 0.5, that area requires development. There's attitudes of frustration, continuous tension, fear of loss of performance, and anxiety. If the area shows a value below zero, that's a critical area, status of apathy, loss of faith, disappointment, and cynicism. You see two figures here. One is the upper one is already comparing results, average results of leaders, because in most of the cases, these collaborative actions are co-led by several individuals or one plus individuals. So with the red line, you see red continuous line, you see the average result of leaders, while with the blue line, you see the team results. So attitudes of the leaders and the teams can be compared. It is also valid for comparison between teams. In this case, if you see that, that leaders and teams perceive very differently their work usefulness, their team spirit, their feedback. So this is, if you would like to improve the efficiency of this collaboration, these are the areas that needs to be developed or strengthened or paid attention to. And then on the lower figure, you see standard deviation of answers. So perceptions of specific areas that standard deviation can be compared across teams or across leaders versus non-leaders. In this case, for example, leaders with the blue line have a high standard deviation for work usefulness while for non-leaders there's a high standard deviation for overload or personal opportunities. And just because I'm just highlighting a few interesting points, if team members think that they have very different personal opportunities within this collaboration, that in the short term or medium term is going to affect a lot of other values and create conflict and lack of trust. So at team level, Areas can be indicated that need urgent development. Those are on the lower figure, you see with, with, the, with the red color, and also areas that are where there are some challenges, but its development is not an urgency at the time of the assessment, shown with this bluish grayish color on the lower figure. And I have some real data for you. So, as in the beginning, I have introduced you that in the past years with my colleagues, we've been focusing on the cross-border dimension of smart specialization. And we brought together regions and member states who have the same or similar smart specialization priority areas. I haven't been moving enough, so I have to stand up to turn on the lights. Sorry, it's a smart building. <laughs> okay, so. Um, yes, so regarding this cross-border cross border, um, initiative of smart specialization, so these regions work together along the methodology that we have defined and with the objective to realize joint investment projects. They work in partnerships and uh, this, this assessment framework has been adjusted to to pinpoint areas where their collaborative efforts could be make, made more efficient. And this is a real result from a partnership that is, ver that is very successful and it has quite a wide ge geographical coverage. And on this first figure, you see the results for leader one and leader two because it is led by two leaders. And so comparing the results of the leaders, there are significant differences of perceptions regarding various dimensions. For example, work intensity and workplace conditions. So the two leaders perceive workplace conditions and work intensity in a very different way. And emotional intelligence and intrigues may predict the perceived presence of continuous mental attack. 
So after the assessment, I have run a validation workshop just to see how the partnership and their leaders separately can, can relate to these results if, if they can identify that these areas that, that, that are highlighted by the assessment are real problems in the partnership. And actually they have confirmed that there is a very unequal distribution of tasks among the leaders, which causes a continuous conflict in the hierarchy. The next figure is again from the same partnership, but it is already comparing the results of the leaders with the red line and of team results with the blue line. So as you see, the work targets, it is like on the bottom right part of the figure, Leaders' results are close to critical, while team results are, are quite optimal. And this means that leaders professionally cover the lack of organizational goals. Despite their internal insecurity, they are able to lead their team projecting security. While leaders have optimal results for vision, team spirit, or feedback, but the team on the team level, these areas need development or urgent intervention. And again, on the, on the validation workshop, I have asked the leaders how they see it and they were about to organize a big partnership meeting. And actually they confirmed that they're, they're going to present the results of this assessment and they're going to, to organize this partnership meeting in a way that they focus on these areas so that they project the vision better and then they develop a new feedback system that helps the partnership to become more efficient, which in turn, hopefully is going to have the team spirit within the team. So this is the standard deviation of leadership and team results where perceptual similarities between leaders can create consistency across the whole team, or on the contrary can limit or hinder the consistency within the team if there's a perceptual difference. So conflicts, what is in, uh, what I would like to highlight here that so there's a high standard deviation for conflict for the leaders. So conflicts perceived by leaders appear as a lack of team spirit among the lone leaders. So what is very fascinating for me is to see the interconnectedness of these areas that on the leadership level, there is one dimension that is problematic, but then it, it is present at the team level along with a different dimension. Okay, this is a result from another partnership. This is a newer partnership, but again, very exciting one. I'm just not saying the name because this, this is confidential data. And um, so insights can be gained from analyzing the differences between perceptions of leaders and team, what we have discussed before. So the perception for the value of usefulness of work or the vision mean that leaders do not project the vision of the partnership towards the team. Because as you see for the, for the leaders, work usefulness and vision is optimal, while it is suboptimal at the team level. And if non-leaders perceive that their leaders do not value their own work, then the leaders project lack of credibility, which in turn hurt authority. Okay, so the applicability of this uh, leadership assessment framework, this is an interesting question, like where do you apply this? Uh, during our email exchanges with uh, some of the students of the Winter School, I know that some of you are involved in Horizon funds, Horizon projects or interact projects. I hope they all went, the submissions and the presentations went very successfully. But so when we are addressing global challenges, I mean, these are projects that don't stop at organizational level or don't stop at borders. So coming back to Interreg and Horizon projects, these involve stakeholders from, from various countries and involve a lot of money, time, effort, and knowledge. They all have a governance structure with, um, with clear leadership. And, um, and I just believe that, you know, highlighting those areas in which this leadership could be made more efficient or sustainable could just 
could just contribute to making these, these collaborative efforts more efficient. I just would like to give you just a few lines about what I'm working on right now. I'm writing a publication on the urban leadership impact on legitimacy, including the gender perspective. Then I'm working on a very exciting project of, of uh, measuring the impact of innovation districts within selected cities like Barcelona, Paris, Stockholm, Eindhoven, Amsterdam. And of course, I'm also looking at the factor, the impact of leadership within innovation district. I'm also involved in a project in Latin America that Maffini introduced yesterday. We're working on improved capacity for running innovation roadmaps at regional level. And what is a novelty is that this assessment framework that I have just introduced to you, it has been adjusted to depict remote working conditions. So to depict our reality. I, before I thank you for your attention, I just, I meant to give you a few words like, what, what was my objective with this lecture? Or I would even go further, like what is my objective with this, with this research on, on leadership? But before I say that, I have to warn you that I'm a militant optimist and I'm an eternal dreamer. So I just, I wish to, being conscious, I wish to induce those 1% shifts in attitude towards your work, towards your hierarchy, towards your team, towards your own responsibilities that induce changes in society. Let it be your doctoral school, let it be your your, your workplace or any social setting. I think, I just believe in those 1% shifts. So in this winter school, we are addressing global challenges. And I hope I persuaded you a little bit that leadership is one aspect through which addressing global challenges effectively can be included. And because without, without leadership and without collaboration grand global challenges cannot be efficiently addressed especially i think today in times when when we are living such a nation centric times where nations are failing to jointly address problems such as a pandemic or climate change and it is just a question mark how they jointly address new challenges rising on the horizon only find a cause to regulate biotechnology or artificial intelligence. And I just believe that through collective, legitimate, and, and moreover, ethical leadership, these challenges at urban and regional level can be just much more efficiently addressed. And I think by measuring the impact of leadership and impact of leadership on the motivation and commitment of stakeholders can, can enable these collaborative efforts to become more sustainable and successful. Okay, I, I really hope that we will be in touch, stay in touch, and uh, I am open for questions right now. Thank you so much.